Welcome to another Deep Dive, listeners. This time, we're all about surnames, and we've got a good one for you. O'Hara. You think you know it, right? Gone with the wind, that whole sweeping romance thing? You might be surprised by what we uncover. Oh, I bet. So are we talking, like, actual Irish royalty here, or is that just, you know, a bit of an exaggeration? Surnames, they're like echoes, you know, whispers of where people came from, who they were connected to. And with O'Hara, it's a whole tapestry of history. We're not just talking about a family tree. Okay, so then where do we even start with a name like O'Hara? Back to the Emerald Isle, I'm guessing. Picture County Sligo, if you will. Rugged, windswept, beautiful. That's where the O'Haras put down their roots. They trace their lineage back to a fella named Igra. Igra, okay. What do we know about him? Get this, he wasn't just any Irishman. Igra was a Lord of Luane. A lo wow. Okay, but what did that even mean? Like, back in the day, in, I don't know, 10th century Ireland? It meant power, influence. We're talking about serious territory in Connacht, a whole province in the west of Ireland. Being Lord of Luane, that put you right in the middle of it all. The alliances, the rivalries. And we're talking way, way back, you know, Igra's death. It's recorded in 976 AD. To hold on to a title like that for generations, that says something. Centuries of power. So what happened? They must not be ruling Ireland anymore? Did something happen? Or Well, history has a funny way of, you know, changing things up. The O'Haras, they did hold on to that lordship, and for a good long while, too. But then, let's jump ahead a bit, to the 14th century. Okay, what changed? The clan split. Two branches, each with their own leader. And get this, each leader had a nickname. A nickname. Come on, you gotta tell me. Okay, so one was O'Hara Bide. That means, like, yellow or fair. Probably a blonde. Uh-huh, makes sense. And the other one? The other one, he was O'Hara Ray, rough face. Can you imagine the family gatherings? All right, bye to Ray, settle down, you two. That's fantastic. They sound like they were right out of those epic Irish tales. Right. And despite the split, they still had a ton of land, over 20,000 acres in Sligo alone. 20,000. Wow. Okay, so two branches, tons of land. But like all families, they don't stay in one place forever. Rick, you got it. Change is inevitable, even for the O'Haras. So they started branching out, did they? Headed for greener pastures, maybe? Where did these O'Haras end up? Some ventured north, yeah, settled yeah. in County Antrim. But here's the thing about names, they're not set in stone, are they? As these O'Haras settled in, the name itself changed a bit. O'Haran, you see that? Or even just Heron. It's like their name adapted as they moved. Fascinating. Exactly, like a living thing almost. But that connection to place? It's strong. Even today, you find most O'Hara's in those counties, Sligo and Leitrim. It's in the very fabric of those places. But like you said, they didn't just stay put in Ireland. The O'Hara's, well, they've made their mark and in some pretty diverse fields, too. And I'm here for it. Yeah. Okay, so who are we talking about? Who are some of the biggest names to carry that O'Hara legacy? Well, let's start with a field that might surprise you. Religion. And not just any religious figures. We're talking big players within the Catholic Church. Oh, wow. Okay. Who comes to mind? Well, there's Bishop William O'Hara. He was the very first Bishop of Scranton, Pennsylvania. That's a position with some serious weight to it, you know, shaping a whole diocese. And his impact, it didn't end there. They even named a school after him in Scranton. A school? That's pretty impressive, gotta say. Any other O'Hara's making waves in the church? Oh, absolutely. We can't forget John Francis O'Hara. He served as the Archbishop of Philadelphia. And get this, Pope John Tick III, he elevated him to cardinal. Wow, a cardinal. Okay, from the Lords of Louis to princes of the church, the O'Hara's, they get around. But we've got more, right? What about this James O'Hara I'm seeing on our list? He sounds like a mover and shaker, an industrialist, right? James O'Hara, now there was a visionary. He came from County Mayo in Ireland, emigrated to America, and eventually he found himself in, well, at that time, it was just this bustling frontier town, Pittsburgh. But he had this vision, you see. And what was his vision? What made James O'Hara so important to Pittsburgh's story? He saw the potential, right. The Ohio River, it wasn't just some river, it was a lifeline, a way to connect, to build. So he poured his energy, his money into shipbuilding, and it paid off. Pittsburgh, it became this hub of industry, and a lot of that, it can be traced back to James O'Hara. That's amazing, one person, and they can have that kind of impact. But from shaping the physical landscape, let's shift gears a bit to an O'Hara who shaped words, stories. John O'Hara, the writer, was his story. Ah, uh, John O'Hara. He was a master, truly. Had this way of capturing the essence of American life, you know? Especially he zeroed in on that upper middle class, their desires, their anxieties. It was all there on the page. And what should people read if they want a taste of John O'Hara's work? 
appointment in Samara. That's a big one. It's it's a pretty biting critique of society, you know, <laughs> how we self-sabotage the circles we run in. And then there's Butterfield 8. That one, it's glamorous but gritty, set against the backdrop of 1930s New York. Fun fact, they even made it into a movie. Elizabeth Taylor, no less. Oh, wow, I did not know that. From page to screen, the O'Hara legacy lives on. And speaking of the silver screen, there's one more O'Hara we can't ignore. Maureen O'Hara, an icon. What's her connection to this Irish clan we've been talking about? Well, she might not have been directly related, at least not that we know of, but, you know, that name, it really does evoke that same O'Hara spirit. The strength, the captivating presence, it's all there. Born Maureen Fitzsimons in Dublin, she was a true original. That red hair, those eyes, and that talent, unmistakable. She really was the epitome of Hollywood glamour. But did she always know she was destined for stardom? What was her journey like? Oh, it's a fascinating story. She got her start at the Abbey Theatre in Dublin. And not just any theatre, mind you. This was a big deal. Founded by W.B. Yeats and Lady Gregory back in 1904. Talk about a proving ground for Irish talent. And it was there, on that stage, that Maureen O'Hara, she blossomed. So another Irish connection. From the Abbey Theatre all the way to Hollywood. What a journey. <laughs> okay, so for those of us who maybe haven't seen all of her films, which ones should we be adding to our watch list? Well, you can't go wrong with The Quiet Man, of course. Oh. Set in Ireland, gorgeous scenery, and that chemistry between her and John Wayne, electric. But she was in so much more. The Black Swan, if you're in the mood for adventure. And for a classic, you can't beat Miracle on 34th Street. She really could do it all. That's what made her so special. It's amazing how both John O'Hara, the writer, and Maureen O'Hara, the actress, they both became such incredible storytellers, each in their own way. But, you know, with all these O'Haras we've been talking about, from religious figures to writers to Hollywood stars, it makes you wonder, could there be any connection, however distant, to the most famous fictional O'Hara of them all? Scarlett O'Hara from Gone with the Wind. Ah, now that's a question that sparked a lot of debate, hasn't it? Did Margaret Mitchell draw inspiration from the real-life O'Haras? It's a fascinating thought. So does she. Did Margaret Mitchell ever say, yep, there was this one O'Hara back in the day, that's who I based Scarlet on? Well, not directly, no. At yeah. least not that anyone's ever found. But, you know, it's fun to think about, isn't it? Totally. I mean, Scarlet O'Hara, she's practically a real person to some people. She's iconic. And, you know, when you think about it, Scarlet, she does have some of those classic, I don't know, Irish traits, you could say. Oh, really? Yeah. Like, how so? Well, she's determined, right? Nobody pushes Scarlett O'Hara around. And resilient, war, loss, heartbreak, she just keeps going. And that whole, I don't know, fighting for what you believe in, even if it means bending the rules a little, that feels very, I don't know, Irish to me. Yeah, I see it. Especially back then in the South, women weren't exactly supposed to be, you know, firebrands. And Scarlett, well, she was definitely a firebrand. Exactly. And, you know, that resonated with people even back in the 1930s when the book came out. Here's this woman going up against all odds. It's a powerful story no matter who you are. It really is. So maybe Margaret Mitchell didn't base Scarlett on a specific O'Hara. But that spirit, that spark, mm -hmm. maybe it was there all along. Maybe so. It's funny how these things work, isn't it? Names, stories, history, it all gets woven together. It really does. Well, i got to say, I've learned a lot about the O'Haras today, from lords to bishops to writers to Hollywood stars who knew one name could hold so much history. And that's just it, isn't it? It makes you wonder what stories are hidden in our own names, in our own families. It's like you said, history, it's not just something in a book, it's in us. It's true. Every name has a story. <laughs> so to all our listeners out there, we want to hear from you. What's your surname? Maybe we'll deep dive into it next. And if you're an O'Hara listening, let us know. We'd love to hear your family stories. Until next time, keep exploring those family trees. You never know what you might find.